Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us. First, I would like to thank Julie Carson and Jean McAvoy from the Immokalee IFS Center for their help and cooperation. Today's program offer one CEU for pesticide license renewal and one CEU for certified crop advisors. Again, if you need the CEUs, please send an email to Gene and the information is in the chat box. Our guest speaker this morning is Dr. Jawad Qureshi, Associate Professor with UFIFS Southwest Florida Research and Education Center in Mwakali. The title of his presentation is Scouting and Management of Citrus Pests. Newly introduced insect pests and diseases have been the main concern of Florida citrus growers and production managers. These problems include the citrus leaf miner, the Asian citrus salad, the citrus canker, and HLB. The rapid spread of HLB and its severe damage to citrus have pushed growers to frequent calendar sprays of broad spectrum insecticides in an effort to control the vector, the Asian citrus salad. This caused outbreaks of other pests in response to accelerated spray schedules, which negatively affected beneficial insects and biological control. A broader perspective with a new look at the entire growth operation must be taken com to come up with feasible and comprehensive plans to manage citrus growth. Integrated Pest Management, IPM, based on growth scouting to determine the need and proper timing for pesticide applications is very critical. That's what Dr. Qureshi has been working on. Dr. Qureshi's presentation will cover recognition, monitoring, and management of insect and mite pests of citrus and their natural enemies. Also, cultural, biological, and chemical methods of pest control, particularly for the Asian citrus steroid, will be discussed. Dr. Qureshi, please go ahead. All right. <clears throat> thank you, Manji. And uh, thank you, everybody uh, who are joining us here and will be listening later to this seminar. Today, I'll be talking about scouting and management of uh, citrus pests. Uh, those of us who work with citrus, uh, we know it well that citrus is colonized by a wide range of pests. And without proper recognition, monitoring, and management, uh, it would not be possible uh, to grow citrus. So that's why uh, today I'll be covering uh, uh, some of uh, uh, those uh, subject areas. So in today's presentation, uh, I'll talk uh, why scouting of pests is important, uh, introduce some of harmful and beneficial uh, insect and mite pests, discuss a little bit about monitoring-based management of Asian citrus salad and why it's important. There are several other pests, uh, which I have included, aphids, white flies, scales, uh, mealybugs, stink bugs, leaf-footed bugs, mites, uh, still uh, others like citrus leaf miner, thrips, fruit flies, and weevils. So they are also important and uh, part of the citrus agro ecosystem. So I'll, uh, and do brief discussions about those as well. And uh, finally, chemical control, uh, which definitely is an important part of uh, citrus pest management now, uh, especially uh, after Asian citrus salad got introduced and particularly after Hong Long Bing or citrus greening disease, uh, which it spreads 
uh, got introduced in 2005. And for that reason, we need to be more careful uh, how we can um, justify our treatments and make best use of those chemical treatments without uh, making uh, extensive applications. So scouting for the pest is important for several reasons. Uh, we want to reduce the risk and avoid surprises. Uh, if you are checking them uh, on a regular basis and find them and start to take measures to control them uh, before they get to the levels where it's uh, difficult to control them. Uh, so that's one of the reason we want to reduce the damage to the tree and fruit, uh, obviously reduce the production costs and uh, optimize our inputs to maximize the profits. And then there are some key biological attributes of insects and mites and some marketing objectives for the commodities, which also justifies scouting and management. Uh, for example, uh, some of the pests such as mites or uh, scales, uh, when, they, when they are found on the fruits and those are uh, not uh, accept, acceptable to the consumers and, uh, and that uh, definitely affects the, the fresh fruit markets. Uh, as well as the quality of the food for the for the process markets as well. So during this process of uh, recognizing your uh, your pests and beneficial organisms and monitoring and taking the management decisions, uh, uh, you you are going through different uh, learning stages. Uh, and, and I always feel that uh, it, it's a good idea to carry some of these materials with you while you are there in the field, uh, some vials uh, to preserve the insects, some uh, plastic jars, uh, hand lenses, uh, aspirators, uh, small size. Uh, so a, a little toolkit if possible, uh, if, if you can carry in your truck. So while you are out there, uh, uh, you, you can look for them and uh, identify them uh, or get to know them to the possible level you can. And uh, you can also bring them back uh, into your office or, or to the experts if you are able to uh, preserve them uh, in the wilds or, or in some other form or shape. So, so these are some of the things that it's good to at least carry some of these, especially you want to have a hand lens with you uh, because some of those insects are very small or some of their life stages are so small uh, that you are definitely going to need hand lens uh, to look for them uh, on the trees. And uh, also you can do the tap samplings. I will explain later on uh, how to, to make those tap samples. And, and, and that way you can also get an idea what's there in the canopies. Uh, especially the large predators and, and some of the pests, uh, such as adults, patients, citrus, beavers, uh, and, and uh, several others. Uh, I, I would not recommend that everybody should be carrying a sweep net with them, uh, but those of you with large operations, uh, I know you, you have your people monitoring the pest populations in the field. So from time to time, it's, uh, it's a good idea uh, to use that uh, sweep net as well, uh, because there could be some uh, pest or beneficial organisms which are in the canopies, but not uh, obvious visually. So if you do some of those uh, sweep net samples at different locations in the block, uh, you can get a pretty good idea on, on what's out there. In terms of the pests, uh, that uh, that we see in, in citrus crops. Uh, obviously, Asian citrus salad is our uh, top target. Uh, and then we have uh, several uh, other sucking pest groups like aphids, white flies, scales, uh, millibugs, uh, stink bugs, and deep-footed bugs. Uh, mites are another important pest group, uh, particularly rust mites and spider mites. Uh, they are abundant. Uh, an, an important pest. And then there are some other insect pests such as citrus leaf miner, thrips, uh, fruit flies, and uh, weevils. Citrus is also colonized by several uh, important uh, biological control agents. Uh, there are plenty of predators 
uh, out there, several species of lady beetles. Uh, there are lace wings, green and brown, spiders, predatory mites, ants, although they interfere with biological control uh, with parasites and even with predators, but some of them are also predators themselves. So, so the, 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 there are a lot more than these uh, that are functioning out there. Uh, and when you go and uh, look for them, if you use different methods like tap sampler sampling or suction sampling, obviously you are gonna see some of them uh, in the groves. Uh, then there are parasites. Those are much smaller in size, but there are several species almost against uh, every pest that we have in citrus. There are, there are some parasites that are either indigenous or they were introduced uh, into Florida. So those species are there. And uh, obviously uh, most of them are not gonna be uh, visible to you uh, visually. Uh, so for those one needs to uh, bring the, the host stages such as nymphs of the Asian citrus salad and rear them uh, to see what comes out of those nymphs, either uh, the pest or the, or the parasites. So you need to make a little more effort uh, to get to know them. Uh, then there are entomopathogens, uh, some naturally occurring species uh, such as uh, Hirsutella, uh, which is a common fungus that we find here in Florida. And uh, sometimes we see high level of infection uh, uh, from, from that fungus in the field. Uh, we, we see up to 40 to 50% mortality in, in some instances. So when we are uh, out there uh, looking for the Asian citrus salad, uh, here you see the three life stages, the adult, uh, the eggs, and the nymphs. Adults are about two millimeter and you will find them sitting in this angle uh, most of the time feeding. Uh, and uh, they are, you can look for them uh, on the young shoots and they are visible visually. Uh, you can also use the tap sampling uh, to dislodge them. Uh, the way the tap sampling is done, you, this is basically a white sheet, a laminated white sheet on a clipboard. And you put um, uh, this at a random locations in the tree canopy and trap the branches with uh, a length of PVC pipe. And you will see these cellars fall onto the sheet and uh, you can look at them and count them. You will also see several beneficial organisms such as lady beetles or lace wings and other pests as, uh, as well. Uh, to look for the eggs, uh, those you are gonna see in the newly developing buds and shoots as you see here in this picture. Uh, when they, they are deposited there, there are plenty of them. So if you look carefully uh, with a magnifying lens, uh, they are very easy to see. Uh, almond shaped, uh, this yellow to orange uh, color. And there, once they hatch, then you see the nymphs developing, which go through five stages. Uh, here I have, uh, picture of mature nymphs that are feeding and producing the honeydew, these white threads that you see here. So these also you can see on young shoots uh, where they need those soft tissues to develop. And you can uh, even see with, uh, uh, with the naked eye or you can use uh, a magnifying lens. So th these are some of the tools uh, uh, that you can use uh, to, to look for them instantly uh, when you are there uh, in the field. So if, if you are monitoring for, for the Asian citrus cellar to make uh, the management decisions or to know the level of populations in, in your blocks, uh, it's a good idea to spread those uh, sampling locations uh, uh, in the perimeter as well as in the interior of the citrus blocks uh, so that you can see how those populations are spread and, and get a good idea uh, on the populations uh, in those blocks. And like I said earlier, uh, you will be doing the tap sampling and it will also be good idea to, uh, if the shoots are available, if it is the time for flushing, and then to look in those shoots as well uh, to see the, the eggs and nymphs and, and their populations. Uh, because this is an insect, uh, which is a very high reproductive rate uh, a single female can lay thousands of eggs, oh, sorry, hundreds of eggs uh, during their uh, life cycle. 
so even at very low uh, adult populations, uh, you may still have uh, a very uh, good level of uh, shoot infestations and uh, uh, eggs that, uh, that uh, were probably already deposited by the females there. And uh, when you are doing that sampling, you can, like I said before, uh, you can also get a good idea on other pests uh, in your blocks as well, and as well as the beneficial organisms. So beneficial organisms, the, the lady beetles, uh, they are one of the important predators, not only for the Asian citrus salad, uh, but for the several uh, other pests. Uh, they, are, they are generalists, so they attack uh, mites, aphids, leaf miners, scales, uh, a wide range of uh, uh, pests uh, in, in citrus crops. And you are probably familiar uh, with these, their adult forms that, you, that we see here uh, in different uh, colors, uh, but it's also important to understand uh, the larval pictures that you see next to them. Uh, please don't confuse them with larvae of uh, any pests or, or worms because these are, uh, these are also doing the same job the, what we'll see the adults doing. So they, they eat hundreds of those, uh, those pests uh, even in, in one day, and uh, they are very good predators. Again, both uh, larvae and adults of these species. And there are several other, I just posted these few, for example here, uh, that are out there uh, functioning. Uh, for the lace wings, uh, we, we see uh, also, uh, you see here the larva of uh, two types of lace wings. Uh, and when you do even tap samplings, they fall onto your tap sample sheets. Uh, and, and here is a adult of a green lace wing. They are still very abundant and they are more abundant uh, compared to the lady beetles. Uh, and it seems that over the years, uh, they have developed uh, some level of uh, tolerance as we talked about Asian citrus alert resistance and tolerance to some of the Insecticides, uh, it, it applies to beneficials as well, uh, because we still see uh, uh, green lace wings in abundance uh, in the citrus growth. And we have done some testing and yet it seems that uh, they also have some level of tolerance uh, uh, to, to some of the insecticides commonly used. Uh, here, the one that you see here on the right side uh, uh, with this, uh, uh, rounded shape, it, it's, it's called the uh, trash bug. It, it's called carrying this uh, trash, uh, um, accumulated trash on the body. And that's why uh, it's commonly known as uh, a trash bug. And, and when you do the tap sampling, uh, you will also see them fall on your taps as well. Uh, I cannot emphasize more on, on the need for the monitoring. Uh, I know there is a, uh, School of thought out there uh, right now, I hear from some segments that since the disease is spread, so what's the point in, in doing all this in monitoring? It's important again to know, like I said before, that it's a highly reproductive pest. It, one female can lay hundred of eggs during her life. And there is no way that you can bring, uh, the, your mature trees may be able to tolerate some populations uh, for, for the few more years, but as you have more populations, you are going to have more problems with the uh, level of the disease. Uh, at the same time, the increasing populations mean you are creating problems for your young citrus. Uh, there is no way that you will be able to bring young citrus into production uh, with the high level of uh, psyllid infestations uh, and, and the HLB that, uh, that they are transmitting and spreading. The more psyllids mean more spread of the HLB uh, to the different groves and, and, and to the young plantings as well, which is going on right now in the state. And, and to the point, we have gone to the testing of producing citrus under the protective structures. And even there, uh, if, if we don't do the monitoring for these pests and diseases, uh, the situations can get pretty bad. And, and we continue to do monitoring using the tap sampling methods, the sticky cards or suction sampling in, in those houses as well. And just a simple example, and, and we see that, that uh, th th these houses do a great job 
of uh, protecting against the Asian citrus salad and HLB. We have seen with the research of uh, three to four years now. Uh, but at the same time, uh, it's important to know that the, these are not foolproof systems. So once in a while, uh, we do get the Asian citrus salad on, on a sticky card and, and imagine that if, if that the observation is not there, uh, and if it happens to be a female, then that female can lay hundreds of eggs in, in that house, and they may go unnoticed. And by the time you will know it, a good population is already established. And then it becomes, they are even protected from the predators, those large predators, because they cannot go in and, and target them. So those populations can build up to high levels uh, very quickly. So, so monitoring and recognition of these pests, uh, it's, it's always important and, and it should be part of the uh, management programs. Uh, we have done this uh, with several of our uh, studies um, that were done over several years, such as this example, uh, where we tested different organic and conventional programs. Uh, obviously there is no threshold for, for this insect, but we were using uh, a threshold for treatment application because you cannot go uh, every other week or every month to make those applications because those are not sustainable. So we were using a, a treatment threshold that when we will hit a 0.1 cilids per tap sample, and uh, we have also done studies with 0.2 adults of cilid per tap sample, uh, and then we will go ahead and, and make the spray treatment. And, and that gave us throughout the life of those projects, uh, gave us a uh, uh, very good idea on uh, what to apply and evaluate the effectiveness of our programs and later on uh, come up uh, with, with the ones that were uh, doing better job compared to some of the others, such as this one of the organic programs where we had organic insecticides in rotation uh, with the 435 oil. Uh, which almost did a good job uh, compared to the conventional insecticide, uh, almost uh, uh, effectiveness wise at the same levels. Uh, there were times when conventional program was more effective, but it was a time lag of only a week or so uh, when the populations will be building up in, in that program as well. So those, uh, those uh, use of those monitoring techniques and those programs also gave us good information on the beneficial uh, organisms. Uh, we still see very good populations of spiders and lacewings, as I did mention earlier. Uh, the lady beetle numbers have gone considerably down. Uh, they were very abundant in the citrus groves, but for the past well over a decade, uh, due to the increased use of uh, insecticides in the, in the commercial plots, their populations uh, are significantly down. The other important uh, biological control agent is the parasite of Tamarixia radiata. Uh, it's uh, now doing a plant industry is producing and, and giving millions to the stakeholders and they are being released for several years. Uh, it's a small wasp. Uh, you can see here the adult, uh, which lays its eggs on the nymph of the Asian citrus salad. Uh, in this circle, you can see the larva uh, feeding and developing on the, on the body of the nymph. Uh, finally, it consumes all the body contents and the nymphs are mummified. Uh, and once uh, the parasite matures inside those nymphs, and they chew a hole in the thoracic region and emerge out as an adult. So obviously, uh, Detecting or, or, or finding Tamarixia adult uh, in the field is not easy. Uh, so if, if you want to see that they are doing uh, their job in your groves, the best way will be to, to go to the shoots uh, that are uh, about two to three weeks old, because that is where uh, the niffle colonies were developing before the psyllid became adult. Uh, and if there were parasites uh, there that attack the names, uh, you will see uh, the mummified nymphs on, on, on those shoots. And even if the adults have emerged, uh, those, uh, those bodies of mummified nymphs will still be there. So that's how you can, you can look for them and their existence uh, in, in your locations. 
Uh, we, we made releases of uh, these parasites uh, for a long time in, in those organic and conventional programs for about three to four years. Uh, and we were able to see uh, them playing a role uh, in, in those programs, uh, especially more so in the organic program and untreated control uh, than the conventional uh, program, which is the red bar there. Uh, conventional programs were, were more strong for them. And uh, uh, they were not able to establish at good levels in those programs. So, but, but in the organic programs, we did see their role in parasitism levels. So that, that tells us that maybe there are some elements of uh, organic programs that if they are integrated in the conventional programs, uh, we may reduce the aggressive nature of those conventional programs and provide opportunity for other tools like organic uh, materials, as well as uh, the biological control uh, to flourish uh, in those programs. And we did see that, that following those programs, uh, there was some hope, at least in one of the organic programs, the green bars here, uh, that we did see a yield uh, that was uh, uh, equal to conventional program and, and better than all the other programs. And that was the program that actually uh, sustained uh, that level of yield uh, from year uh, to year. So concluding on the Asian citrusylid uh, management, uh, uh, we did see some long-term um, uh, uh, testing of different programs that organic insecticides with 435 oil uh, provided significant control of Asian citrusylid and yield benefits and indicating the potential of their use uh, in, in different citrus and integration into other programs. Uh, obviously, organic management plan itself uh, will help control psyllids in the organic citrus and the spread of psyllid from those blocks to the other habitats. Uh, whereas for the conventional growers, uh, there's an option of diversifying their programs uh, by including some of the organic insecticides uh, in their programs. And uh, by reducing the use of conventional insecticides uh, will help conserve and augment the biological control uh, it will help with reducing the secondary pest outbreaks because if we are using more of those insecticides, uh, we are causing damage to the biological control and the pests that are not a problem can become problem uh, later on. Uh, issue of pesticide resistance and residue is another uh, that needs to be addressed and that's why uh, judicious chemical programs are needed. Uh, successful area-wide management of psyllid and HLB uh, will require use of uh, uh, all the available tools and uh, integrated approaches. Uh, we now are uh, uh, running uh, projects where we are testing different uh, IPM, integrated pest management programs for Asian citrusylid by combining some of those tools like organic and conventional insecticides uh, in, into one program and also uh, using biological control, uh, both the naturally occurring predators as well as uh, using some of the commercial species uh, that are uh, available. So moving on to some, some other pests that, uh, that we encounter uh, in the citrus groves uh, among the aphids, the green citrus aphid and the brown citrus aphid are the two important ones. Uh, and uh, most of the time you will see the green citrus aphids and one of the characteristics is that you will see this curling of uh, leaves. And if you see uh, uh, on the underside of those leaves, you will see the colonies of those aphids developing. And most of the time, you are going to see them uh, during the springtime. Uh, the brown citrus aphid, uh, for several years, their populations are, are very low. Uh, very rarely we see them, and uh, which is a good thing because it's responsible as a vector of uh, citrus testiza virus, uh, which could be a very serious threat. So by not having this brown citrus aphid is a good thing uh, that the spread of this virus is, uh, is not happening uh, at, at any level uh, that, that, that is uh, dangerous for the industry. There are several species of uh, citrus white, uh, white flies there. Uh, citrus white fly by itself is the, the most common. 
uh, and we also have uh, citrus uh, uh, cloudy winged whitefly as well. Uh, and as the name uh, suggests, uh, you can see the uh, difference in, in their color patterns uh, and, and to, to differentiate them. But most of the time, it's not easy to do in the field. So you really need to bring them to, to the uh, the experts and let them have a look, but mostly it's the citrus whitefly uh, that, that's common. Uh, their nymphs are somewhat uh, similar. Uh, there are parasites that uh, attack them, beneficial wasps, uh, and, and you will see them. And again, when you will see them, uh, you will see the holes in the nymphs, these rounded holes that I am pointing out here in this picture in the bottom. Uh, and up here on the left side of your screen with this nymph, you see a white empty uh, skeleton of the nymph and, and a little slit here uh, that you will see when white fly adults came out of uh, those nymphs compared to this rounded hole down below uh, from which the parasite uh, came out. Uh, then there is also a friendly fungus out there that attacks these nymphs and that's another advantage that we, we have different elements of biological control uh, that are working there in the system. And there are some other species like uh, woolly whitefly or the nesting whitefly. And again, uh, those are uh, not very common, but they are there and, and, and you will see those names are associated uh, uh, with uh, some of the uh, structures uh, that, that appear uh, with those names, for example, here, uh, you will see these white filaments around the names, and that's why this uh, nesting uh, structure uh, and, and the name uh, nesting uh, white fly. We also have a citrus black fly. It's called, uh, it's in the same uh, category, but it's, it's called black fly because, because of the color. Uh, it's, uh, it's blackish or, or, or dark blue as, as you see adults, as well as the nymphs. And uh, there are also parasites uh, that uh, attack this uh, black fly as well. You see a nymph here with the hole. Uh, their populations, we, we don't see them common in, in the field. Uh, there could be some isolated cases, uh, but where it happens and uh, they are not controlled, then their populations can, uh, can escalate. And, and, it, and you can see the situations uh, to the levels where you have very high populations, uh, a picture uh, on the top uh, left corner of the screen. Scales uh, is a large group. Uh, there are several, uh, uh, there are actually two groups, the armored scales and soft scales. Uh, armored scales, uh, you see this armor-like structure on, on, on their bodies, and, and you can actually, sep when you turn them, uh, you can actually separate this armor from the actual body of the scale. And the other characteristic of these armored scales is that they don't produce the honeydew, uh, whereas the other group, the soft scale, they do produce the honeydew. And in those soft scales, uh, the body cover and the actual body, uh, uh, you cannot uh, separate them. So there are several uh, armor scales like Florida red scale, purple scale, glower scale, and, and chaff scale that, that, that you will see them. Uh, Florida red scale, uh, you will see them on the foliage as well as uh, on the fruit. Uh, these others also, uh, they are spread in the canopy, uh, but uh, not, uh, not so much on, on the fruit surface. There are predators and the parasites that, uh, that attack uh, these scales, uh, such as a phytus holoxanthus, that's a parasite uh, which attacks uh, Florida red scale. There are several <coughs> lady beetle species, uh, including uh, this one here, uh, which is commonly known as the twice stabbed lady beetle. So there, there's a good amount of biological control uh, that is going on in, in the groves. And obviously it is something uh, that, uh, that we don't go and look for it very often, uh, but, but it is happening at different levels uh, in the groves. 
uh, some other examples of uh, armor scales, uh, snow scale, lesser snow scale, or fun scale. And, and this, these names refer mainly to the, to the males, as you see from the color and, and the way they look, uh, somewhat uh, appearance or resemblance with the snow. Although the females are, are larger in size and, and different in color, like in case of uh, the snow scale here, uh, a purplish color and, and a much a larger female uh, with, with this uh, ridge uh, in, in the middle of the body as, uh, as well. So these, these, these uh, their population, they are also not generally under good control and not very common, uh, but once it happens, uh, they, they can get to uh, very high infestations as well. You can see them on the limbs in, in different parts of the canopy. Again, there are <clears throat> biological control agents, uh, like in this case, uh, you see several of these uh, chylochorus lady beetles uh, that are feeding on these scales. Uh, but as I mentioned earlier, that these are some of the pests that can uh, be formed on, on the fruit surface. And uh, that could be a huge issue for the fresh fruit markets, and, and as well as uh, they, they will reduce the quality of the fruit. Uh, and a very heavy infestation can also uh, significantly affect the, the trees as well. There are, uh, there are different uh, soft scales uh, that we see, uh, a black scale, and then we also have green and brown scales. This, this Caribbean black scale is the one that is more, uh, that we see more common. You will see this edge shape pattern uh, as here on, 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 on this individual on, on, on the body. Uh, names are found on the leaves, twigs, uh, adults are more on the larger limbs. Uh, they produce a copious amount of uh, honeydews, as I mentioned earlier, uh, one of the characteristics associated with the, with the soft scale and, and that can interfere with the photosynthesis. Uh, there is a biological control, like I mentioned before, uh, there are lady beetles. In this case, I have a picture of this ash lady beetle here uh, and, and its larva. They are very good predators of uh, scale insect. And also there are several other species and the parasites as well. Citrus millibugs are uh, another uh, problem. Uh, again, uh, they are not uh, as widespread. Uh, some, some other pests, um, but once they're um, they established in some place, uh, the situation uh, could be serious. The one that we used to see is uh, the commonly is the citrus millibug, uh, and, and you see them here on, on the left side in, in infestation on the fruit as well. Uh, and, and here uh, on the right side, uh, you see the Labak millibug uh, <coughs> imps and uh, and that's the one that was found a few years ago in, in, the, in, in some parts of the state. We do see uh, their infestations. Uh, they can be confused with the cotton cushion scale, their ovisex uh, uh, to some extent, uh, but the cotton cushion scales, and their ovisex are more whitish and more organized compared to this uh, labic millibug, uh, which are more uh, disorganized, clumpy, and uh, not so clear, more uh, white color, as you will see for the ovisex of the cotton cushion scales. Again, there are predators uh, that are available. And actually in this case, uh, this uh, millibug destroyer, uh, it's, uh, it's a very good predators um, and, uh, which affect uh, multiple species of millibugs. And uh, I, I myself uh, have experience with this couple of years ago, we have a, uh, a screen house there and one of our faculty. Uh, he came up to me that there was a heavy infestation of a millibug in there. And, uh, and we ordered some of these uh, millibug destroyers and, and released them in that house. And after uh, some time, and they did a pretty good job of uh, bringing those populations uh, to very, very low levels. And we have, uh, some other pests, grasshoppers, uh, crickets, katydids, uh, leaf-footed bugs, all those, but we see them very rarely. They can cause damage to the fruit. 
uh, but usually we, we don't see them uh, a major problem uh, in the crops. Mites are uh, one of the serious pest problems, uh, especially rust mites. Uh, and they are a problem, uh, in, in, particularly in, in the fresh fruit, but as well as in the processed, uh, we have seen them population in the processed fruits uh, as well. And uh, their populations uh, can flare from copper sprays and broad spectrum insecticides. Uh, there are two types there, the citrus rust mite and pink citrus rust mite. Uh, it's, it's not very easy to distinguish them morphologically. Uh, and the pink rust mites populations are usually uh, much lower compared to the uh, citrus uh, rust mite populations. Uh, but you, their effects can, can be seen on the, on the foliage as well as they can appear on the fruit. And uh, that's why it's, it's important uh, to, to know them. And, and obviously, definitely, you are going to need uh, uh, a hand lens uh, to look for. They are very small and these longitudinal bodies, uh, on, on the, you can find them on the leaf surfaces as well as uh, on the fruits, uh, but you are definitely going to need, unless the symptoms become so obvious, and that will probably be too late at that point. So you, so you need to be looking for them from time to time uh, so that you know well when the population start to build and you can uh, make the uh, proper management decisions. Symptoms of the fruit, uh, if, if the infestations are high, and the early damage could look like a shark skin. Uh, you see here in this picture on the top left corner, and later it can even uh, get worse, and, and, and you will be seeing these bronzing uh, symptoms uh, on the food. Spider mites, uh, another important group uh, of, uh, of mites, and, and, and their infestation could. Uh, yeah go high during the dry weather. Uh, you will see on the stippling damage on the upper surface of uh, young hardened leaves. Uh, and this, uh, this can get worse as you see here. Uh, and, and if it happens that the populations are very high, then, then you are gonna see a lot of this damage and also uh, the food drop, uh, the leaf drop uh, as well. Uh, there are different species uh, of uh, these spider mites, uh, citrus red mite, uh, Texas citrus mite, or six spotted red mite. And uh, it's, it's easy uh, to, to differentiate them from, from the coloration of, uh, of their bodies or from uh, uh, those uh, dark spots on the, uh, on the bodies of, uh, of, of their individuals. Uh, fall spider mites, uh, Brevipelpus species. Uh, there are a couple of them uh, in Florida. Uh, and they are a vector of uh, leprosis disease. Uh, but luckily, uh, we don't have that disease in, in, in the US yet. Uh, although there is a risk that uh, it can get introduced uh, from, from some other countries uh, where it is. Uh, Present. The broad mites, uh, uh, these, these are small size uh, whitish color mites, and, and uh, they are found in the, in the greenhouses and in the places where there is shade. Uh, they are also sometimes found on uh, lemons and limes in the, in the, in the, in the field as well. Uh, again, uh, they, they, they are not. Uh, uh, very, very common, uh, but, but a serious uh, problem in, in certain situations. And when that happens, uh, you will see uh, the symptoms uh, appearing on the, on the fruits uh, as well. For the management, uh, uh, biological control agents uh, that work against uh, the mites, uh, the predatory mites are one of the uh, largest group, uh, I'm sorry, uh, that, uh, that work uh, against these uh, pest mites. Uh, 
Uh, there is also a fungus, Hirsutella, that is out there, uh, which, which attack uh, the pest mites. And uh, the functions of, of these predators, uh, including uh, there are some lady beetle species as well, uh, but their function is uh, definitely disrupted by the heavy use of insecticides and compost sprays. Uh, but there is still plenty of uh, potential for the biological control, uh, especially the, the predatory mites. Uh, we have some projects going on uh, for several years uh, in the these protected production systems, uh, which is called CUPS, uh, as well as in the open traditional production systems, uh, looking for uh, these predatory mites so that in the future, uh, we can identify the species which, uh, which can be mass produced and used in these structures for biological control. Uh, interestingly, uh, even with the nature populations, we did see uh, five to six species of uh, predatory mites in, in, in abundance in those structures. And the two dominant species were Amblyceus stematavensis and Tiflodramus perigrinus uh, that were found uh, uh, almost throughout the year uh, in, in, in those structures. So, so that tells us that there, there's a potential there uh, in, in, those, uh, in those closed houses even these predators can, can uh, get into those structures. And then in the open uh, production systems, uh, we have been looking into conventional uh, production systems, organic production systems, and untreated situations. And uh, we have found about 20 to 25 species of uh, predatory mites uh, from uh, those locations. And uh, that is a great resource uh, to know that we have such an abundance of predatory mites. And uh, my student, she is wor working on those and uh, we will be identifying at least some uh, that have the potential uh, to use in the biological control uh, uh, in, in the future. Obviously these things takes time. Uh, even there were issues with the uh, proper description of uh, some of those species and we have to go ahead and re-describe, I think six or seven species. Uh, we just published that work recently, but, but there is a huge potential. And we were, we were surprised, although uh, those conventional programs were not very uh, intense, um, but still they were conventional programs for several years. Uh, but the, the number or the abundance uh, was not very different uh, in those conventional programs. Uh, compared to the organic uh, programs of, of these predatory mites. So then there are uh, several other uh, citrus pests, as I mentioned earlier. Um, there are citrus uh, leaf miners, thrips, fruit flies, and uh, root weevils. Uh, citrus leaf miner is a huge problem, uh, and it continues to be. Uh, there are very high population of, uh, of this pest. Uh, the field and mainly it's the, the larvae and they make galleries or mines in the leaf surfaces. Uh, and when they do that, they, they expose the leaf cuticle uh, to the causal pathogen uh, of uh, citrus canker disease. So, so they are not, not the vector of the pathogen, uh, but they definitely uh, exacerbate the effect of uh, citrus uh, canker in the field. So there are pheromone traps that are available uh, that can be used in the field uh, or sex pheromone lures uh, to tra trap the male populations and uh, know their abundance, and their flight in, and peaks. And, uh, you can do the visual inspections and it is very easy to find their infestation uh, on the leaves uh, when, when they are there from the mines and, and the, the presence of the larvae. And you need to have uh, a mechanism of looking into that as well, so that you can see the effectiveness of uh, your management program as well after you apply those, uh, those treatments. There is a good biological control of uh, this pest. There are several indigenous parasites that are out there. Uh, I have listed several of them, and the one that 
uh, we have seen in most abundance is uh, Nigelio minio uh, here uh, in, in orange, uh, you see in the list. And uh, those, those, are, those are abundance uh, compared to several other species uh, that we have seen and providing good level of uh, parasitism. <coughs> Then there are uh, some <coughs> introduced uh, parasites that were introduced in Florida or several years ago, and they are still in the system. Particularly and uh, the one on the left, the Geniaspis citricola. Uh, it's, it's, it's still present uh, in abundance uh, and, and we see them uh, in, in the commercial groves and they're still in very high levels. Uh, we did some work a few years ago, uh, one of my visiting scholars uh, on the East Coast in, in grapefruit and uh, we were seeing uh, high level of parasitisms uh, in the range of uh, 40 to 70% at certain times, which is very encouraging. Trips are uh, another group of pests, uh, which again could be a problem uh, if, if their populations are high. And uh, the flower trips, as the name suggests, are, are associated with the flowers and are known to cause damage to the flowers, especially in Naval and Valencia oranges. So that's, that's the threat that, that is more common. Uh, then there are some orchid trips and uh, greenhouse trips uh, that, that are uh, associated with causing uh, wind damage. Uh, to the fruit surface, uh, such as here in this picture in the, in the grapefruit. But there are also good biological control agents uh, for these trips as well. There are several uh, predatory mites that targets them, uh, as well as uh, there are lady beetles and uh, this minute pirate bug, which is also a good predator of uh, trips. Fruit flies are another important uh, group. Uh, luckily, it's only the carob fly uh, that is uh, present in Florida. Little fruit fly was found, uh, but eradicated, and the uh, mat fly uh, is uh, not known to be in Florida. These fruit flies, uh, uh, they lay their eggs in, in the food and the larvae develop in the fruit. And then at some point, either the fruit drops on the ground or the larvae somehow drop on the ground and then they pupate in the soil. And then the adults emerge. And their life cycle is usually, depending upon the temperature, it's, it's completed uh, within 21 days. <clears throat> Weevils, uh, another important pest group. Uh, there are several, uh, like diaprepes, blue green leaf weevil, little leaf notcher, and Sri Lanka weevil. We see them from time to time. Uh, diaprepes is a more serious concern. And uh, there, there, there were some infestations uh, that are seen. Uh, in the Central Ridge area, as well as we have seen on the East Coast. Uh, so they, they, they are important pests, as well as uh, the Sri Lanka weevil. That's, that's one of the weevil uh, that's in Florida for a couple of years now. And uh, it's spreading and uh, it, it has a very wide host range. Uh, we see them in different crops, uh, including uh, citrus. Here is a generalized uh, 
life cycle of, of the weevil and that they lay eggs on the, on the foliage uh, in masses and uh, their new nets larva on the leaves uh, later on uh, they drop down uh, and, uh, uh, to the soil surface and uh, they, they feed uh, on the roots uh, below the surface uh, and then pupate in the soils and then finally the adults come out. Uh, for the Sri Lanka weevil, uh, instead of uh, laying the eggs, they may lay in the canopy. It's, uh, there's not a whole lot of work <clears throat> to know that, but, but we know that they, they, they also lay, uh, more, more likely they lay eggs on, on the soil surface uh, rather than uh, in the canopy. Uh, some pictures of uh, root weevil damage and their different life stages. Here you can see adult on the top and the foliage feeding. Damage to the roots from the larvae. Uh, you will see large egg batches. And usually if you will see that uh, the, the two leaves are glued together, uh, that is the behavior of this insect. And, uh, if you look in there, you are gonna find find the eggs of uh, of this uh, this weevil. And then here in the down right corner, uh, you see uh, you see the larva of of the root weevil. There is a a, a good level of egg parasitism uh, on the on the eggs of these root weevils, and and we did some work a few years ago. And uh, it was very interesting that we, we were finding a good level of parasitism, uh, averaging, uh, I would say, around uh, 45 to 50% uh, yeah, at different uh, locations, and, and both in sweet orange uh, as well as uh, in the grapefruit. So th that's why I keep saying when I talk about these several pests, that uh, it is something that, that is out there uh, and it's a, it's a natural suppression, which is happening at different levels. Uh, it's only that uh, it requires a lot of effort and uh, it, it's easy to see the kill with the chemical control, uh, but also that comes with the collateral damage. And that's why uh, we need a more justified use of chemicals uh, because we still have a good resource of these biological control agents, uh, which is out there and contributing uh, to the control or the natural suppression of uh, these different pests. Uh, just a few pictures of uh, Sri Lanka vivo. Uh, you see it here, the adult. Uh, down below, you see the, the larva and the eggs here, and also uh, the feeding damage. Its feeding damage can be distinguished from those uh, local species of leaf notchers as when it feeds, it, it goes uh, deep into the leaf surface from the edges. And that's one of the characteristic that, uh, that will uh, tell you that uh, and the, about the presence of, uh, of this weevil in, the, in, in your location. Uh, in order to uh, distinguish them uh, from uh, the local uh, species of these leaf notchers, uh, the first thing you can see here is that these uh, Sri Lanka weevil are more bright color. And then you see these patches of black on their elytra, uh, which you really don't see uh, in these leaf notchers. And also the color variation uh, is also very easy to differentiate them. Uh, also, you will see these uh, spines on the, on the femur of the hind legs of uh, Sri Lanka weevil, uh, which you will not see uh, in case of uh, uh, these leaf notches. Uh, so finally, and uh, before I elaborate more on, on this slide, uh, I would like to say that this is just an example so it is not a recommendation at all. Uh, this just sums up some of the considerations uh, that uh, all of us who are working in citrus uh, need to be considering uh, in order to have more uh, justified programs. Uh, so basically, uh, this tells you that you have different options. 
uh, over the course of the years, starting with the dormant season and going all the way to the growing season. Uh, obviously, uh, you have uh, different pests, uh, like I described several of them, and, and you are going to see them at uh, different times of the years, uh, which, which are listed here. Uh, and then you also have different choices of chemicals, and, and you know that there are several of uh, those products uh, uh, that are known to affect uh, multiple pests. So, so you can make your selections wisely uh, to choose the chemicals uh, that you can target more pests uh, than just targeting the one species so that you don't have to uh, make additional applications for, for the other pest species. So dormant season or, or the winter months are the times uh, when most of the trees, especially the mature trees, uh, they are not producing the new growth. Uh, although I know the scenarios have changed because of the HLB disease. Uh, and, and if you get the rains, you, you, you are gonna get the flight. But in general, uh, there is less uh, new growth. And uh, so there is less opportunity for the Asian citrus salad uh, to reproduce and multiply their, uh, their populations. So it's mainly the adult sailors that are there uh, during the winter months. So if, if you can make applications of uh, some of the organic phosphates and pyrethrides during that period uh, to knock down those populations. So then when the spring flush comes, then, then there will be very few of, uh, of those adults uh, going into the spring growth, which is a major growth of the season and uh, try, uh, increasing their populations or, or later in the year. So then during the year, uh, you will have the options of, uh, of several other products uh, that you can make selections. Uh, we have uh, plenty of uh, uh, mode of actions out there now from where the selections can be made uh, against the uh, multiple pests. And that way, uh, you, you, if you are not using some very hot chemistries during the growing season, uh, you can also uh, give opportunity for, for the biological control for the predators and the parasites uh, to be able to do their job uh, in those systems and increase their populations as well, uh, which is also needed for, for the sustainable uh, systems uh, over time. Uh, again, I said uh, we have even gone to these uh, uh, protected systems, uh, either in order to produce the large acreage, particularly for the fresh fruit markets, or we have diverted to uh, individual protected covers, or we call them mini cups, uh, where uh, we, are, we see several growers using them in the traditional open production systems. Uh, by covering uh, the young newly planted trees uh, and, and protecting them from ACP and HLB. Uh, our uh, couple of initial years, but again, it's, it's very important uh, to monitor all these structures uh, on a regular basis uh, to look for the past uh, problems uh, because these are not foolproof systems, as I said, uh, we have seen Asian citrus salad, uh, very low numbers, but still, and if you let them uh, uh, go unrecognized, uh, they could build up to high populations. And, and then we, we have seen populations of mites, scales, mealybugs, uh, and, and another pest uh, in, in all those uh, protected structures, uh, including the large cups, as well as the individual protective cover. So monitoring again is key uh, in, in all these uh, systems. With that, uh, I would like to thank uh, several of the state and federal funding sources uh, who have provided uh, funding over the years, including USDA NIFA, uh, Citrus Research Board, Citrus Research and Development Foundation, uh, Florida Department of Agriculture and uh, Consumer Services. Uh, we have collaboration with them and we have plant industry also for uh, several predators and parasites uh, uh, that uh, the work that we have done uh, uh, in both the open traditional system as well as in the protected systems. Uh, I would also like to thank uh, my staff, uh, 
both at the Southwest Florida Research and Education Center and at Indian River Research and Education Center uh, for their hard work. And uh, uh, I thank you very much uh, to all of you uh, who attended the seminar. And uh, you are more than welcome uh, to ask the questions or I have my email there and then you are always welcome uh, to send your questions through email or, or call me. Once again, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Qureshi. Any question? If you have any question, please go ahead and speak up. Or you can write it in the chat box. Again, if you are interested in CEUs, please send an email to Gene. Include your name, your email address, and your license number. The presentation was recorded. So the link to get access to it will be available in a few days. If you are interested, let me know or let Julie know. It looks like I don't see any questions. Thank you all for your participation. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, Jean. Thank you, Dr. Qureshi. And we will see you next month. Thank you, Manji. Thank you, Manji. Thank you, everybody.